All right, guys, welcome to another motivational hour with Mr. Bet on you. I have my friend Matt here. Um, we're going to be doing a pre recorded video. So you're watching this on the premiere on YouTube, but we're actually, it's Tuesday, 3 p.m. Um, and I like to always bring you guys. We brought a few individuals already Tanner Markley uh, last year, and then a few months ago, we brought in Travis Thomas, the motivational leadership coach from the U.S. Men's National Soccer Team. And today I have Matt with us. Matt, how you doing, man? I'm doing wonderful. I just want to say thanks for working around my schedule. Sorry this couldn't be live, but uh, I think we'll still create magic no matter what. Oh, absolutely, man. I appreciate you being here and taking time. I know you're a really busy guy. A um, little backstory. I, you know, as some of you guys know, I, I have tattoos. I, I like tattoos. It's a style thing. It's a way for me to kind of like, like, like pinpoint certain aspects of my life on my body. I just always been, I've always been intrigued and really liked it. Um, and, and Matt has a shop that I go to and uh, he runs a really great shop over there. And that's how we've met. Um, so Matt, if you can kind of talk to us a little bit, how you got into tattooing, making it a business, being a small business owner, and then the other businesses that you kind of run, like just get us, sure. get us into the journey of how you started with that. Sure. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name is Matt and I've been tattooing since 1995. I always knew I wanted to tattoo. I started tattooing professionally when I was 20. Um, and it was, I don't think I, I considered too many other avenues. And so when I did get an apprenticeship, I hit it hard. And it was definitely a time where, you know, we talk about cancel culture. Tattooing was pre-canceled. Um, when when yeah. you would get, when you'd get your forms tattooed back in the nineties, you were, the act of it was saying, I don't care about the normal nine to five. And we had to be really conscious of protecting people from themselves by the act of of getting tattooed and mm -hmm. so the way i grew up was really you were a shaman you were a guide you were an artist you were a rock and roll you were a punk rocker you were all these things to your community and the focus was always on the connection and the transact more than the transaction the experience yeah. trumped all that was fun and it was the most inefficient business mindset and inefficient business model that created um a lot of great results. So it was a weird time where you could be pretty dumb with money and you could still be half talented and you could do really well for yourselves. As tattooing progressed and as my career progressed, I took it around the world. I lived in Japan and Brazil and Europe and um, this is all pre-internet. So I studied the craft and I still consider myself a student of the craft. But I took that to the road so I could learn more about tattooing and how other people are approaching it. And this was a time where you couldn't just call someone up and ask like, hey, I don't know you, but how do you do that? So yeah. you have to spend some time with them and build some trust. And so that is how I developed my craft into tattooing. As it became more mainstream, as shops started becoming run a little bit more efficiently and you start introducing things like marketing and um, advertising and uh, the idea of customer service still wasn't a thing back then because we were uh, a system where you were a guest in our world and we gave you 30 minutes of crazy and you went and had a good story. That isn't the case anymore. And I don't know when the threshold changed, but I do know that about 14 years ago, I quit drinking. It was a very conscious effort to quit drinking. And I quit drinking because I started asking myself a lot of questions and as far as it went to business, I was 10 years into tattooing 18 years ago. So I'd start asking myself these questions about 18 years ago. So I'm 10 years into tattooing. Mm -hmm. First time I can remember asking myself questions about what I'm doing is, why would somebody drive two hours to get tattooed by me? Why would someone drive by 30 shops to get tattooed by me? Yeah. yeah. Why would someone get on an airplane, get a hotel room, rent a car? and get tattooed by me. So I had to start considering myself a product. I was no longer just someone who was having a good time and providing a service. So when I changed that mindset that I was an actual product and treated myself as an entity and put my time and effort into building that up, um, that's, I think, when I crossed over from the fun of tattooing, which it's still fun, but you just can't survive with a, a minimalist mindset where you run an inefficient business in tattooing. I think in the beginning, the, the, 
the discrepancy in entry level tattoo artists and competent tattoo artists, you might have been about a ten twenty thousand dollar difference at the end of the year. Yeah, but I think looking at now closer to sixty to eighty thousand dollars difference. In huge the difference. Wow. And that just goes to show that you cannot run an inefficient business anymore. So I brought you up to speed as far as my mentality towards tattooing. And then what ended up happening was um, I got into some business coaching as a, as a, um, as a client. Hold on, man. Sorry. Go, go upstairs. That's all right. Go upstairs. Okay. You could play that. Go play in the room. Go play in the room. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. So I started getting business coaches. I was working in St. Louis and New York at the same time. I was yeah. flying to New York, um, tattooing there for a couple of days and flying back home, tattooing in St. Louis. And I just, I opened up a shop by now and I, I felt like a big phony. I just felt like this ginormous phony. I had the things that I thought I was supposed to have. I had clientele. I had bought a building. I had a business, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was mimicking and I was throwing spaghetti against the wall. So I hired a business coach to kind of give me that mm. second set of eyeballs on my actions. Yeah. yeah. That really inspired me. Um, and then the second business coach I got gave me a book called Strength to Strength. And in this book, the author talks about going from your fluid intelligence to your crystallized intelligence. And what that means is when you're young in the game, everyone bows to you because you have the talent, you have the energy, you have the resources. You're like and the hot product, the hot commodity. Yeah, Dude, the resources, the whether you're an artist, whether you're a business person, whether you're good with numbers, your God-given talents just come out and you get these accolades, but that that's not a that's a finite path. And you we all know that person that should have stopped playing basketball or should have stopped uh, going on stage or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And for those that can recognize that in themselves and say, look, my accolades are done. Now it's time to support. That's when you jump off that train and you jump on a train for crystallized intelligence. That's taking yeah. your worldly knowledge, everything you've ever done and being able to add up a scenario and say, I know it's probably going to happen next, not only for myself, but for you as well. And I support you and your, in your endeavors. And I want to see you collect the accolades I collected as a young man. And so that's the position I put myself in. And that's what led me to being a business coach, what led me to running online communities, what led me to running a shop where I try to lift up all the artists that work for me. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like the condensed version of, of my journey and kind of the the different, the different, I don't know, yeah. phases that I went through. And I, and I see that when I'm in that shop, I see the other tattoo artists in there, the, the banter, the relationship that you guys have. And I can, I would imagine you help cultivate that your level, you know, you're lifting up other artists in your community. Right. And it's not just about Matt being the best tattoo guys. Like, how do I make this guy and give him a, a space to be creative and, you know what I mean? I think that's really awesome. Every time I go into the shop, that vibe is kind of there. You can kind of feel it. It's not being said, but you just know that it's there, you know, within those relationships that you've cultivated, you know? Um, I, I really like when you're, you know, let's talk about the traveling a little bit. What led you to Japan and all these, you know, was it was it the art you wanted to learn from people but, and they were there? Or what led you to kind of be this worldly uh, artist? I think that a big part of it had to do with that my parents, before I was born, lived in Paris and they spent a little bit of time in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up hearing those stories and being from a small town of Fairview Heights, Illinois, right next to Belleville, Illinois, um, the, the, the future looks very bleak in small town worlds. And so I always dreamed of there has to be more than this because I don't fit in any of these molds in this town. And so when I was able to start tattooing and able to start traveling with tattooing, I think it was just a matter of taking advantage of it, number one. And number two, um, tattooing hadn't married each other like it has now, where if if you were, let's, let's take food, for instance, if that, that can be relatable. Yeah. I know when I go to Japan, I'm going to get a cuisine that is totally different than what I grew up with. When I go to Brazil, I'm going to get a cuisine that's totally different than what I know. And tattooing was like that. It was very cultural. It was very, um, a lot of rooted in rites of passage and, and mentality of tattooing and outlook yeah. on tattooing. And 
So it was important at that time to not just hear about Japanese tattooing, but to go there and experience it. Yeah. It was to go to South America and experience it. It was important to go to Europe. And um, that's what I was doing. What has happened, and this is something you can't recreate. You can say I'm a traveling tattoo artist now, but what they didn't get, which I was very, very, very fortunate, was that I got it before the Internet smoothed it all over. Yeah, yeah. Talk to me about that. So you mentioned earlier, you mentioned before the internet and, you know, tattooing has obviously changed. Like what, when was it? Was it in the nineties? Was it the certain, the LA or Miami ink shows? Like, you know, I'm not, not I don't know a lot, but I, sure. I know a little bit. Like when was it that it really changed? You know, you've been in the game for a long time, right? When did it change? And do you think that it's changed for the better or the worse? Well, let's just set this up really quick. And let's say, where were we? What happened and where are we now? Yeah. So where were we? We were in a time where tattoo artists was underground. It was a subculture. And you got tattooed by the tattoo artist in your subculture. If you were a biker, you got tattooed by a biker, right? Yeah. If you were in the gangs, you got tattooed by the, someone in the gangs. Punk rock, all the same thing. And so we all had our circles that we ran in. And it was instant feedback. And there was a, always under the gun. It wasn't like I could tattoo someone and then never see them again. I was going to see them at a show that night. I was going to see them in the future. And they were the, the feedback was way worse than Google reviews. Google reviews, you can brush off. Yeah, yeah. But it's when hard to brush off hard. feedback directly when it's right in your face, right? In your face and to your immediate um, market, which is the 180 people in your area, whatever that whatever that is, right? Yeah. 180 might be a low number. But we start thinking about the people that matter to you, the market you're trying to break into. Yeah. So this is where we're at with tattooing. And then um, Lil' Kim gets tattooed and some of the basketball players get tattooed and MTV starts showing tattoos. ESPN starts showing tattoos. Yeah. And now people are thinking, well, that's not so crazy. And they start creating an interest in tattooing. And now we've got to the point where we have no regulation. There's no government oversight. But now you got more people getting tattooed. So we start creating government oversight. We start creating uh, licensing. When I started tattooing, we didn't have licenses. I was actually able to help write some um, or at least influence some of the literature that's been written towards tattooing. I wouldn't say I wrote it, but I, I was I was there. And so as we get exposure and we lessen the price to get a tattoo, not financially, not monetarily, but socially, the social currency yep. was lower to the point where it was easier for people to come get tattooed. As yep. that happened, there was less consideration in the permanency of it. And so the trade-off is it was more about the experience back then. It made a statement. It said F you to the man. It said F you to, to whatever. And so the act of getting tattooed was the important part where now the act isn't as important and people want to have culture. So sometimes I, th I think a drawback might be they invent culture. They invent yeah. things that they think they might be uh, that might relate to them. So that's kind of a one a one thing. And I think Miami Inc., all these things that influences Miami Inc. was was a drama TV series that was edited for the for the viewer. You have to remember this. Yeah. And so they did a lot of like, uh, you know, my fill in the blank here, had this disease here and died here. Like whatever it was, it was a formula. Yeah. And so yeah. then everyone started thinking, well, do I need a formula to go into a shop and tell them about my tragic story? And we had those situations. But um, now what we're seeing is an industry where Forbes puts it at almost $3 billion. Mm. A private firm puts it at $13 billion with one third of that being and then just the transaction of tattooing. Mm -hmm. That turns some heads. That's, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, now you have, you know, I'm sure they've been around for a while, but like you, you have these, these conferences and trade shows and all these things that happen month to month i would imagine some kind you know and it's like the 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 exposure of it's crazy before yeah if you had a tattoo you were like a, a badass a biker ex-navy seal like you were somebody and it was like i'm an anti-establishment maybe if you're the punk rock and you know if you had tattoos on your hands or on your yeah. forearms you were like then eh. now it's like you got them on their face it doesn't even yeah. matter right you you see somebody with tattoos you don't even blink an eye. Most people don't because it's it's very normalized, right? And it's a business. It's a billion dollar business. I mean, it's it, it is. 
And, and you, you you nailed it. And so how tattooing has changed for the better or for the worse? Look, man, if those guys on Miami Inc. are now pulling in a million a year, that means we have a chance of having a, a, a true sustainable career path if you take it seriously. Yeah. yeah. That's how I started looking at it as like, well, you know, I think at the lowest after 9-11, I think I made $24,000 after 9-11, but I wasn't positioned mm. to make money because I was traveling. Mm. From that, I had to rise. Um, yeah. I, I think yeah. the first three years I tattooed, I definitely made over 100K a year. The first three years I tattooed as a young man, that was a lot of money. And I can say that I only kept uh, a, maybe 10% of that in any type of uh, investment, which yeah. is yeah. crazy. Because if I had to put all that away, I'd be retired now. Oh, well, looking is. back. Yeah, yeah, looking. It's easier to look back now. Uh, let, let's, I think it's a good segue. Let's get into you mentioned, you know, you, you've got five businesses, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you got the tattoo shop, obviously, brick and mortar right. Tattoo shop, right? In in, uh, in in St. Louis, I can say, you know, it's in St. Louis. Um, and then you have what else? What 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 are, what are the other things and businesses sure. that you've done? Well, that, that it's a big Venn diagram, right? And they all kind of overlap, and that's the important thing to remember here. So I want to put this out here, saying I'm not. I don't have like a a, a wash and wax over here, and then I've got you know a little you know, restaurant over here. I'm not, I'm not spreading myself out like that. I'm making sure that one supports the other. And the yeah. important part about having five different businesses is that each one's an entity and each entity, I need a different hat when I work on that entity. And I think as a young entrepreneur, anyone who's starting out can't figure out the A to the B, like they're a commodity mindset. I do this. So I sell that. And they don't think about what, what commodity am I really selling? Am I selling experience, service, or commodity? What am I really doing? And so the other thing about when you are starting off, you don't realize that you are a boss to yourself. And then if you don't start thinking like that, you know, there's a great book called The E-Myth. I encourage anyone who's starting off in entrepreneurship to read this book because it you need to write down all the jobs that it's going to take for you to have this successful business. So you're going to be a marketer. You're going to be a CEO. You're going to be... A secretary, you're going to be um, a sales, you're going to wh whatever all these departments are, who's going to who's going to sh ship everything, who's going to do all these things you yeah. are until you can hire out. Yeah, because in the beginning, you have to know you have you're going to do it all because if you so I think sometimes what I see is people, they start a business or they start a brand or they start something and say, oh, I got to hire this person. I got to have this. I got to have that. And then they fail because they, they got no money at the end or they don't know what those five key attributes are within your business and you don't know how to interwork them and how to hustle through it. So you got to do this stuff on your own, don't you think? And Most definitely. I mean, you, you the, the good quote is you hire when it becomes painful. When it comes pain, too painful for you to do it yourself, that's when you hire your first employee. Mm -hmm. So like that. Um, I tattoo. That's Matt Hodel Tattoo LLC. The money generated from that uh, goes into a bank account that is for that LLC and then I can take a draw off that. That also pays rent to my next business, which is Ragtime Tattoo LLC. And all artists pay rent to that. So then I bought the building. That building is called uh, Wishbone LLC. And mm -hmm. so we have residential in the building and we have commercial in the building. And all of those renters pay to Wishbone. So you can see what I'm doing is I'm recapturing my money. I'm just not getting it right away. Yeah. Even with Ragtime, I'm not taking a draw on Ragtime. Any money that it's generated has gone back into the building or gone into an investment of some type or some type of overhead. I'm not using that money to live on. I'm using Matt Hodel Tattoo LLC to live on. All the rest of it goes to making sure everything else is supported. So at the end of the day, when 20 years goes by, I will have bought a building for no more than what the down payment of it was. And I'm mm -hmm. fortunate enough that the, I lucked out in the building where it has, is at is up and coming area. So I totally oh, just lucked out. Totally oh, yeah. lucked out. Very, so up, very yeah. up and coming. Very up and yeah. coming. It's, it's, you know, we win some, we lose some, right? Yeah. It all comes out in the wash as long as you're charging forward. Um, so then when I we started this conversation today and I said that I was trying to help other people with their accolades, that's when I decided that I wanted to become a business coach. And I, I, I think the biggest thing was I had been helping people this whole entire time, giving them advice. Uh, I used to joke and say it was unwanted advice for deaf ears. Like if you'd only listen to me, you'd be smarter. 
But the problem was, is I didn't I, listen. I can relate to that a little bit. I do some of that myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we do. And we, when we, when we know something and we think we can help someone, what we do is we hear the first problem and we jump right in and offer them a solution when that's probably not the problem. Mm-hmm. So by going through some of the coursework that I went through and the ongoing education I went through to be a coach, I basically have learned how to, to pull the problem out by asking a series of intuitive um, questions and intuitive listening, really looking at the person, how they operate, and, and then basically putting a second eyes on what they do. Coaching is called shared thinking. Um, and so by having another set of eyes on what you do, and that's what I do, I help them to... Um, unlock what they can't see. So that's one thing. And then I realized that, well, I can only help, you know, X amount of people at a time. I've, I, one time I was coaching five people at once. That is yeah. a lot of people because yeah. you have to, be, to leave yourself at the door and see everything through their lens. So that takes a lot of mental shifting to do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I decided I would do the online community. And we have about 50 people in there, 20% uh, engagement, which is uh, pretty, we actually have more than 20% engagement. We have almost a 40% engagement, which from what I understand in online communities, that's pretty good. That's 40% is pretty high. Yeah. So if you've got 30 people or so that are active out of that 50, that's, that's pretty good, man. Yeah. And I understand some people are more of the voyeuristic type um, yeah. and, and that's cool, but um, so this is how it all, it all, it is all around tattooing. It is all around uh, maximizing my time. It's all all about how each thing can be as helpful as possible. I want to give what this means in a way people can understand it. Cause I think this is where people mess up a lot, Carlos. Mm-hmm. They never look at the followers they have. They look at the followers they don't have. And so they're constantly on the chase to get more followers. When, if you think about this really quick, if you have a thousand followers, if you have 3000 followers, if you could reach out and touch 40% of them, right? So 3,000, that's 1,200 people. If you could reach out and connect with 1,200 people, that's a lot of people you can connect with. That's, that's, a, lot lot of people. that's a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that everything I'm doing is about who can I help that's in front of me and become that lighthouse to attract other people instead of, I think entrepreneurs screw this part up so much. They do today's math. They can't see into the future and they jump over. You hear this all the time. They're always jumping over uh, dollars to pick up pennies. You know, when a lot of times what, what is right in front of you is what you should be doing. There's a, a I have a spiritual mentor I really like listening to. He's a good person. And he uh, he told me a long time ago, he told me two things. One, adults go to bed when they're tired, which is so, so true. Stop <laughs> watching YouTube videos. Unless it's this one. Stay late and watch this one. But the second thing is have one conversation at a time. I think multitasking is overrated. I think that if you um, understand what the next conversation is supposed to be, what that really boils down to is if you're an entrepreneur, the first thing you need to learn how to do is understand the difference between important and urgent because not everything has to be done right away. You will not get to your goals if you're concentrating on urgent. Mm. You know, I think, you know, I think a lot of us, I can relate to that on some level, because I think sometimes if I'm thinking about myself and things that I want to accomplish, goals that I have set, right, you know, we we tend to sometimes, we get anxious about things we can't control, or we think it's important or urgent, and really maybe it isn't, trying to figure out that balance, you know, of trying to figure out like, what, what should I attack, and how many balls should I really juggle, right, and how many conversations should I have, I think a lot of us, and I've been guilty of this more so in the past. It, I try to focus on like, oh, I want to accomplish these 10 things today. I need to talk to these 10 people. I need to set up these 10 contacts. I need to make these 10 calls. When sometimes if you do the 10, but they're not really impactful or you're not engaged, it might be better to do one or two, mm-hmm. right? It might be better to do one or two in a, in a very, like in a, in a more useful, impactful way than focusing on the 10 things. And maybe... Maybe one of those goes well. Maybe all 10 go mediocre and then you get nothing out of them. But if you focus on the one or two really good conversations, really good learning sessions, a great, you know, this conversation, you're going to learn something. Right. Um, that could be more impactful. I think it's kind of what I'm hearing a little bit. And I've, I've I've struggled myself sometimes with trying to figure out what is important and what is urgent. You know, I've, I, I, I sometimes understand that 
yesterday's problem or yesterday's thing that was urgent might not be urgent today or might not be important today, looking back, you know? You know how you can tell if someone's going to be a good business person? It's how they carry themselves in life in general. I love hiking. And you just reminded me of somebody that, that I know that is terrible at business and they're terrible at hiking. Because they take the whole entire thing and they figure out how many miles the hike is. They figure out what time it is. They figure out what time they've got to be back to the car in order to get beat rush hour traffic. And they're always thinking ahead of what they need to accomplish so they can position themselves in this unknown time. Yeah. They have no idea what they're going to find on that hike. And you know what? They don't remember anything about the hike because it was just a task to get to the next task. People who are good at entrepreneurs, they don't give a shit about the end of the hike. They just enjoy the hike. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the journey. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely learned that. I used to be more, okay, I got to get to this. How do I get to there? How do I get to there? And situationally for small things, I think that could be good. Right. But when you're thinking bigger picture and you're thinking about growing a business, a brand, being impactful for 20 people, 20,000 people, whatever that number is for you, when you enjoy the journey and you enjoy doing it, you enjoy the interactions you enjoy the failure that comes with it. You can't be afraid to fail, right? It's part of it, right? I, don't, I haven't met one person that's successful that hasn't failed, whether it's with sports, a tattoo shop, a YouTube channel, uh, a restaurant, like you're going to fail. Like you have to be able to kind of just enjoy the ride a little bit. And I think too many people want to get to the finish line without wanting to actually race. They don't want to put the time and the effort to race and the practice and, you know, the, the thought that goes into it and enjoying the race. They don't enjoy the race. They just want to get to the gold medal. And, and I think we have a lot of what I like to call like fake entrepreneurs or like get rich quick guys. And it's like, they don't, you know, they might last for a minute, but like, they're not, they're not really being impactful for themselves and the people that they are saying they want to be impactful for. You know what I mean? I definitely know what you mean. And I think that, um, I think that the things I've said today, if they've resonated with you, you're on the right path. If you've woken up at any point in time and said, why am I doing this? You're on the right path. Mm-hmm. If you're doing this and it's too easy, something's wrong. There is a form of resistance that is self-created. And if the more you feel it, the more you are going in the right direction. And I'm not talking about self-doubt. I'm saying when you post something online and someone just craps all over it, when your friends say that's not possible. I'm yeah. not, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying, you, you know, you should build your own airplane and fly across the Atlantic. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there are times when the resistance you're, you're feeling is the North Star in your guiding light. And you, if you play it safe, you will get nowhere. of the profit from business comes from risk. You do not make money. You do not profit by playing it safe. Now, I want to back up and say, I don't do anything purely for the profit. I do everything for the impact I'm going to have on people's lives. And I get an indirect reimbursement financially and monetarily because of that impact I have on people's lives. I think that's the second part of it too. If you want to have more success in your business. If you want to create a larger bank account, instead of sitting down and figuring out overhead and uh, how you can save money here and charge more there, look at the people. If you're in the service world, whatever you're doing, focus not on what's internal, focus on the impact you're having outside of your business. Because if you're not having an impact outside the walls of your business, whether that's a solopreneur or four man operation or 200 man operation or woman operation, whatever it is, If you're not having an impact on the outside of your walls, you will die on the vine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, it's, I want to, I want to kind of get into a little bit here before we round it out. I think in 2024, like, you know, a lot of people that watch this channel, some of the people I'm sure you interact with, maybe people that, you know, like, you know, a lot of people are struggling for whatever reason, right? You know, inflation, cost of this, cost of that. Rent is up for most people, you know, it, it, it's the average person, especially people that watch this. If you're watching this, you know, a lot of us are struggling. You're doing DoorDash, you're doing Instacart, you lost a W-2, or you're doing this as, to supplement income because because of everything around us is more expensive, right? Um, has some of that affected what you do or has it in some ways helped? Because, do you, you know, are you able now to coach and lead individuals that might need a little bit of advice and learning from you 
or is it, it, it are we finding like more people don't have the money maybe to get a tattoo like how is how is the state of like the economy is that impacting you and what you do at all have you had to shift anything i feel like since covid a lot's happened and changed you know how has that affected your businesses I hate to do this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it to another analogy. It's the only way I know how to talk. Uh, I, I like the analogies. I'm building them. Most people aren't as motivated to water their flowers when they're blooming and pretty. They really are motivated when they first get them, and they're yeah. motivated when they see things are going wrong. But when everything's going right, there's a lack of motivation. They think that they've somehow achieved something, or they don't need to. Yeah, don't touch it. I don't want to break it. I don't. I don't know exactly what everyone's mindset is, mm-hmm. but people come to me when there's change or transition. Yeah. And as far as what you're saying about uh, we we are down a very different um, economic situation in the past because it was ballooned with um, government um, subsidies with COVID and whatnot, plus the water hose effect that we had with COVID, where everything was shut down. Then blasted out and we have that hockey stick spike in the economy and everything's mellowing out right now. Um, I would say that it goes back to the idea that you, you probably had a point in time in your career where you were inefficient and you were being rewarded for negative behavior. You were making money or, or you were moving forward and you were doing nine things wrong. My brother is in the NFL for almost 10 years. He played in the Super Bowl. Um, his achievements are a very much um, an inspiration for me. When we, he sits down and watches a football game, he says, a high school football game, you're lucky to get one player to actually run the play correctly. College level, you're lucky if t- only two people don't run the play correctly. But when you're in the pros, everyone better run the play exactly how it goes. And so what level do you want to perform on. Mm. If you just want to go to to the market and sell your wares like you do pottery or whatever, and that's your thing, you can take a lot of the stuff I say and apply it or don't apply it. But you can't be surprised when things don't work out. If it's fun for you and it's not your main income, then keep it fun. Yeah. But Henry Miller, the author, once said, eventually you have to figure out what's a hobby and what's a career. The minute it becomes a career, do you want to be a high school football player or do you want to be a professional football player? What are you doing in your downtime? Are you training? Are you doing a little bit of extra? And so now if you're not as busy, you should be utilizing that time to maximize your skill set for when it does get busy again. Because it's, 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 you know, your spreadsheet only says the tattoos that you do do or the money you do do. It never says what you didn't do. And so I think efficiency and effectiveness are kind of misinterpreted sometime Mm -hmm. but i think uh, reviewing how you do things to be the most effective is the best best position to be in when it is slow like this because when it picks up again you know let's you could probably 2x 3x your income by what you learn today when it because it's going to turn around it's going to get busy again yeah yep so use this time efficiently so that you can be more effective when it does Yeah. How do you how, how are we and how are you reacting to the current state of what's happening in your life, in your business, in the economy? Right. I think a lot of people, we, we were reactive instead mm-hmm. of being proactive. And when we need to be reactive, we're not proactive and vice versa. But like right now, yeah, if, if a lot of people are struggling, if you're trying to sell this, you're trying to start this and, you know, if, if, if you love it and you're doing it just as a little side thing, do it that way. But if you want to grow the business, you got to be able to withstand the slow times and learn why why is it slow and what can I do now to where when the when the when the, when it starts going back up I can two and three X that to make up for the what I missed out on. I think a lot of times people just feel sorry for themselves or they're just too really easy to quit. We're a society that we want everything right now. We want instant everything. We we get our information so fast. We see people on social media and they only show you the good shit. Not all not the real stuff, right? And people get sucked into that, I think, sometimes, and they're not willing to figure out, like, okay, it's not great now, but it, 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 what do I got to do to make it better? And I know with through the economy, it's always up and down, right? Right. And when it's going to be up, okay, I got to position myself in the spot to capture those dollars, that marketplace, that experience, that consumer, the most effective. Instead, people just, woe is me, it's going to end, it's the world, it's like everything's bad, I can't do it, and 
when you have that attitude in my perspective, it's like you're already defeated. You know, right. if you're not, if you feel that way and you're not willing to adapt. You're really not an entrepreneur. You're just somebody that wants to take advantage of something or you think you're a business owner, but you're really not, you know, um, but we're in, we're in a wild times, obviously, you know, but I always enjoy talking to people that have a very positive outlook, but a realistic outlook. And Matt, Matt has it. Every time I go into your shop, like, you know, these conversations we would have, or I'd hear you talking to other people that you're tattooing and, you know, my guy's doing his thing. And it's always a real realistic um, perspective, but it comes from a, a lot of experience. Right. Um, and, and I've always, I always appreciated that. And I always thought it was really neat and interesting. And I always knew, like, you know, I've always, I told you this before, and I tell my audience, I like to try to surround myself with people that are smarter than me and that know more than me, because I, I, I've learned now as I've grown up, I know, I, I kind of like didn't know what I didn't know when I was younger, because I'm, I was a punk and, you know, I was just like, I know everything. I was a little cocky maybe. And as I become a little older and have a little more experience, it's like, you know what, like, why surround myself with people that are on my level or below me? Just why? Because it makes me feel good? No. You know, so I always like to try to bring people on the page or have great interactions with individuals that I feel like are a level above and know a little more and I can pick their brain and they can help my audience. And, and I think we've done a little bit of that today in this short little segment. And uh, I super, super appreciate that. Um, what is, what, what, where are some of the places people can find you? I know you said you got a website and you got some things. Where can people find you on the socials or any in any other place? So the, I've tried to set myself up. So if you just Google Matt Hodel, you should see a bunch of resources there. Uh, the jackpot community is uh, jackpotcoaching.com. You can check out that website. Uh, the tattooing is ragtime tattoo. You can go there and you'll be able to get a hold of me. Those are those are the easiest ways. Plus, if you Google me, I've got about six or seven websites out there that you're going to you're going to find me. Um, I, I do. I do. I uh, want to say thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I understand what you were trying to say with that last question. And I would say this. What are people doing while it's slow like this? I've already been through it. 2008, mm. 2001. Yeah. I've already gone broke. Yeah. Pain is a motivator. This is going to wash out the people who don't have grit. This is going to wash out the opportunists. This is going to wash out the predators. Right. And so the people who have a vision, who don't have a self-defeating mindset, who have grit, this is your opportunity to position yourself for when it is better. For everyone else, you are a statistic of the four out of five businesses that will fail before the first five years. So the ones that make it, you you earned it. You 100% earned that five-year mark. So that's yeah. what I would say. I think that's a great way to end it. I think that's, you know, I, I like that because it, 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 it can motivate individuals or maybe not. Maybe it defeats some and maybe it's this, you know, business and entrepreneurship might not be for everybody. And that could be OK. We need W2 people. We need people that, you know, there's a lot of different things and opportunities of where you can where you can make money and be successful and be impactful. Uh, Matt, I appreciate your time. No, today. Thank you very much. And uh, hope to see.